The term overlanding has become quite popular in the 21st century by many. Many of us see it as an endowment to our character or lifestyle, but where did this name overland come from? From Arizona desert canyons to New Mexico high country deep in the heart of Apache lands, this weekend's posse follows along the same route the first overlanders used about 150 years ago. The history is painted with strife, courage, and pure frontiersmanship, and if you stick around, I'm going to tell you that story. As always, my name is Cody, and you're watching another episode of the White Dog Overland Experience. Good morning YouTube and welcome back to another one as always. We are camped out right now in the bottom of a small wash under this big old red hill behind us. We're about seven miles north of San Simone right now. San Simone is out that way. Those are the Chiricahuas off in the distance. And uh, these mountains right here, I've been driving by for many, many years and I've kind of always wanted to check them out. So we're gonna get breakfast made get on the road, get up in these mountains, go check out some cool stuff, and I'll tell you a little story about them. Recently, overland travel is a name people embolden their lifestyle with. Buying the latest and greatest vehicle, equipping it with the most sought after expensive gear, and taking it into a well-traveled, maintained county road and sleeping in a tent they spent three months worth of wages on with heat on demand. And shit, I know some of you with a line of credit open for when a new piece of unnecessary tech drops. But enough with the rant. The story I'm here to tell today is about the origins of what we do. In 1857, John Butterfield was granted a contract to establish a stage line from Missouri to San Francisco. It stretched across the southern half of the country through regions where weather would not restrict travel for 365 days a year, but another element to its hindrance was waiting to the west. Pushing 100 miles a day, carrying valuables, mail, food, and all sorts of other shipping items, there were stops roughly 20 to 30 miles apart from one another for resupply and fresh needed horses. 141 stage stations were constructed across five states, and 35 of those lay within Arizona and New Mexico, the two most inhospitable states. The stretch between Lordsburg to Tucson was considered to be a 50-50 run, even far more dangerous than its route through Comancheria. In 1862, the Civil War put a damper on the route after it was seized by the Confederacy, but after the Bascom Affair in 1861, this would ensure its demise. Chief Cochise of the Chiricahua Band of Apaches swore vengeance against the white man and indiscriminately murdered any traveler between the Steins Pass Station to Apache Pass and the Dragoon Foothills stage stop. As we entered through Cook's Canyon, the formation of the canyon walls illustrated stories from centuries ago. The Battle of Doubtful Canyon was not the most bloody battle of the Apache Wars, but one that put the cavalry back ahead of the Chiricahua Apaches' terror. 
In 1864, a unit of 56 men headed from Fort Cummings to Apache Pass took the route through Steins Pass where they would meet a band of 100 Apaches waiting in war paint. The cavalry would successfully hold off the ambush with only six men injured and 20 Apaches killed. Even after a great loss, the Apaches would retreat to their stronghold, regroup, and continue more raids throughout the San Pedro Valley and would not stop for another 20 years. Prior to Lieutenant Bascom's ignorant stunt at Apache Pass, the Apache tribes were quite hospitable to white travelers. Documentation even showed Cochise supplying stagecoach stations with wood and other supplies. But once you cross an Apache, it is ensured that the vengeance will be delivered. Chief Cochise was a humbled straight shooting man who had not come to terms with the white man until Army Scout Tom Jeffords created a peace between the whites and the tribe. Jeffords even entered into a blood ritual with Cochise in these mountains in Doubtful Canyon and would be the only white man to know where the great chief was laid to rest. If you would like to know the full story on the Apache Wars, I implore you to go check out my video from last year that details the full story. Well, we just hit our first piece of uh, private property. Kind of expected this, but we're locked out. Can't go to the other side. I was hoping we could get onto the other side and uh, get towards Doubtful Canyon, but it is all private property. So I think this is the extent of what we can do in here. So we're gonna have to turn around, get back onto that gas line road and then uh, head over towards Steins. So just a little backtrack, but we at least got to see this really pretty canyon. So. I'll take it for what it is. Welcome to New Mexico, boys. We just crossed the state line. pop out here and check this out there's a big old mine shaft i didn't even realize it but this looks pretty legit did you uh did you mention the name of this mine yeah. say volcano mine volcano mine sweet and uh gold lead and copper gold lead and copper yeah usgs sweet this is a huge shaft this wall is massive too Uh, it's filled in at the end. This is big though. First year, 1885. Last year, what'd you say, 1982? Yep. Wow, almost 100 years. Looks like there's another shaft up top too. This is ginormous. Kind of a bummer, the ghost town of Steins is closed to the public. Uh, there's no access here. Kind of bummed out, but I mean, some of these old buildings, like that looks so legit over there. Steins Mercantile. I mean, I bet the stuff inside there is just so cool. There's an old stagecoach right there, right there. It's just, God, I really wish we could walk through here. But the route we just came down from is uh, Steins Pass. It was named after an army officer, Enoch Steins, who was on his way out here in 1856 after the Gadsden Purchase headed to Arizona. And eventually the town was obviously named after him as well. So the town was eventually developed 
uh, around the 1880s for the Birch stage line, uh, similar to the Butterfield stage stagecoach route, uh, bringing mail, you know, commissary, whatever, from the east to the west. And this was the last stop of the Butterfield stagecoach route, which uh, from here, it would take it up into the pass from which we came from today, up into Doubtful Canyon, where obviously there was a big, uh, big military shootout with Apaches. So just some of the most rugged land out here, but this town, this town is so well preserved. I really wish we could get a better visual on it. I wish I could show you guys more, but Part of it's still BLM land on my phone and then part of it shows private, so I don't know. It's all locked up. There's just so many houses over there. There's some stone houses. They're just old and dilapidated, but pretty well conditioned, I'd say, for the most part. The mines that we were up in uh, about an hour ago up in Steins Pass, those were the actual mines that contributed to the boom of this town. Sorry, I got the 10 behind me. It's a little noisy. Um, they were pulling gold and silver out of there in the 1880s and running it down to the town where they had a smelter here in 1882 where they would refine it. So speaking of trains, obviously the Union Pacific Railroad was the only reason this, this town was able to survive at any point. Because there's no natural water source here, the Union Pacific had subsidized government money to run water to this town, which obviously helped the inhabitants survive as well as, you know, refining all the ore and whatnot that they pulled out of here. And that rail line was first established in 1878, so that was pretty much at the height of the Apache Wars. So. I'm sure uh, inhabitants here had some conflicts with Apaches at some point, certainly up in these mountains. Um, this was kind of a junction for the Aravipa Apaches, Shikonan Apaches, and Membrano Apaches all over this area. And by 1944, right around World War II, all the subsidy money for this town to bring um, water in dried up, quite literally. So all the inhabitants were out of uh, a place to live so the Union Pacific offered them a one-way stop out of town to a new place to relocate. Uh, the last little piece of history in this town really the only last uh, latest thing I can find was by 1988 a couple actually bought this and offered tours of it similar to a town um, near Lordsburg I can't remember the exact name maybe Valentine or something like that which does tours uh, they're guided I really wanted to do it but we're not gonna do it but this couple bought this town, 1988, offered tours, and uh, by 2011, the owner was murdered, and uh, pretty much this place has uh, sat private since, so no entry, but I mean, you can just imagine how cool this would be to tour. I really wish we could, but maybe not in this lifetime, but at least we can see it from out here. Well, Steins is neat, so we're headed out of here. Uh, we are going to Lordsburg which is actually another stop on the uh, Butterfield route. I don't believe the building is still standing, but we're gonna stop in Lordsburg, get some fuel, get something to eat real quick, and then we're headed up into the Gila.
So we got our uh, campsite established for the evening. We were looking on the map and there's mine shafts like all over these canyons surrounding our camp spots. So we're gonna hike up to a couple of these and see what we can find. That's scaring me, dog. I guess that's oh, wow. Dig down. That is, uh, was it John Malone's shaft? I didn't see the ladder. That's, yeah, the yeah, that's cool. filled up pretty good. Yeah. Nice. Good morning, YouTube. It's about 8.30. Finally just warmed up. It got pretty dang cold last night. Everything uh, everything froze pretty good, so I think it dropped under, under 30. We got out of camp, inbound towards a section of the Big Burr Mountains riddled with abandoned mines. I began to think of how strange of a hobby this is. A couple of dudes in built-up Toyotas who drive to remote destinations just to find giant holes in the ground. Maybe it's pure fascination with the past, or purely just appreciating someone's lifelong work, but either way, I'd much rather be out here doing this than pretty much anything else. Silver dollar mine, right? I mean, it kind of held up. Now they're just loose again. <laughs> this thing is huge. What's in there? Yeah, that's all new two buys and shit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, those are brand new two by fours. Like brand new chain, brand new chain down in there. Oh, that's deep. By the 1880s, the reign of the Apaches was coming to a near close. The word spread across the Union, and the stalemate of the Arizona Territory expansion was almost gone. Although nearly 85% of Apaches had been relocated to reservations, there was still that 15%. The area we were headed into in the Burrow Mountains was a location where a family of homesteaders would come face to face with the remaining renegades. A family by the name of McComas would build a homestead in Thompson Canyon in the spring of 1883 with a small herd of cattle. One morning, the family set out on a picnic, but the timing of this escapade was unfortunate. A raiding party of Apaches, accompanied by Chiefs Bonito and Mangus, was raiding down in the Santa Rita Mountains where one of their men were killed. Chiricahua Apaches had a rule, where if one of their own was killed, everyone in their path was considered guilty. The raiding party made its way into New Mexico, where it would enter into the Burrow Mountains near Thompson Canyon. They came upon the White family, killing both parents in a brutal fashion, and captured the six-year-old son named Charlie and headed back into Mexico. General George Crook sent out a search party, but when revealed they were back in Mexico, this gave Crook the excuse to stay in pursuit across the southern border, and it was granted by the Mexican government. 
This was the first time this had been done in the entire 20 year stretch of the Apache Wars. A group of 150 cavalry, 200 Apache scouts would claim victory over the renegade band in Mexico, bringing back 120 to the American reservations. Although unfortunate, this incident gave way for the government to finally pursue the Apaches down into Mexico and end the war. Even though the cavalry killed most of the last chiefs and squaw, the most famous renegade was still plundering southern Arizona and Mexico. That man was Geronimo. His reign of terror would continue for another two and a half years before finally surrendering to the cavalry in Skeleton Canyon, just south of the Chiricahua Mountains. We're at the end of this road here. Off to uh, check out another mine. We'll see what's in store. Well, found one shaft. Let's see, walk over here and see what's up with that. Uh, oh, go back up out of this and then we can go. it's filled in. Well, just another prospect. I think that's a lot of what's up here, but on this side of the mountain, I see more tailings. So we might be finding the uh, shaft over there I'm looking for. Oh, this is, this is the one. Kyle, we found it. Oh yeah, buddy. Holy cow. This is it, dude. This is the one I was looking for. Nice, just finding holes in the ground. Cheers. Time to go get camp. So the temptation was too much. There's one more mine up here, uh, supposedly on the map. So we're gonna climb up this hill. It looks pretty neat. Almost looks like there could be some uh, cliff dwellings or something up here. It's really rocky. So we're gonna go check this out and then probably camp somewhere down uh, in this big pasture area because this is really nice. Well, 
I am not sure uh, the purpose for all these old trucks up here. It's a building right there. Another building sort of over there. Then the road keeps going up that way. I just don't have the uh, slightest clue why all this is up here, but it's pretty neat and random. It's kind of what you get out here in Gila National Forest. It's just a conglomeration of stuff left behind throughout the centuries. Two wheel drive out here? Yeah. Oh, it is, huh? Yeah. Man. Someone did yank that cover, huh? Rocker still works, dude. Does it? Yeah, it's fine, ain't it? Yep. Yeah, still good? Nope. Nope. Hold tight. <laughs> GM. Mm hmm. Nice. Alright, this thing's cool. Dozer right there. That's sweet. Well, it's uh, it's just a dead end, so we're going back down.
this uh, trail definitely seems like it has not been used in quite some time. It's wicked overgrown. It's really kind of, there's no tracks through here. So uh, pretty much just kind of following it blindly, but it is recorded on Onyx and it shows it's a road all the way back out to the uh, 90 near Silver City. So we're gonna see where this takes us, but I'm kind of glad we're getting into something a little more uh, less maintained at this point. This road uh, has just gotten way too tight. I mean, it is it is pretty much straight up from here, and we hiked up to the top, and it just uh, it does not look good. I didn't really do my research on this trail, but it's apparently called the Gnarly Trail, and uh, it's a 50 inch uh, 50 inch restriction. So this thing's like 86. So I guess uh, we're turning around here. Got to see how I can uh, flip around in this area somehow. up here in Silver City uh, resupplied on some beer and the essentials and now we're headed way back up from which we came hopping on a road that is not marked I have no idea where it's gonna lead what it's gonna do and it should drop us down into the Gila River got a nice camp spot picked out out there so we'll see what the rest of the day consists of An important figure in the documentation of the Gila is a man by the name of Aldo Leopold, an American conservationist, professor, and professional lion and wolf hunter. By 1911, he arrived in the Gila where he would petition to have it the first recognized wilderness in the United States Forest Service records. A true frontiersman documenting wildlife, plants, river systems, mines, and many other important features of the wilderness. Hired by ranchers to keep the wolf and lion population within a manageable degree, he had a quote from his write-up on the Gila that really impacted me. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes. Something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then, and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, and that no wolves meant a hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. Thus is the legacy of the Gila, a beautiful and unique forest with majestic mountains and a complex interwoven fabric of all living things." End quote. There is something so unique to this area, and that's the reason I've returned for so many years. Its rich history and beautiful landscape that seems so untouched keeps my interest so captivated. Next time you go out into the backcountry, try to remember that every range and every valley has a story to tell. Dive into its history not only for what it's worth, but to understand its past and appreciate it a little further. Like I always say, it's not about what you have, it's just about what you do. Don't overlook the tales of the wilderness, and don't sit on the couch and miss out because you don't think you have what it takes to see places like this. At the end of the day, your fancy gear is worthless when you consider what stagecoach drivers endured on thousand mile journeys into hostile areas. Forget about the comforts you bring with you and just rip it. You'll have fun no matter what, I promise.
take a walk down here and check out this that is just so uh still right there perfect fly fishing spot Ooh, it's cold real cold man this is beautiful let's try this new mexico craft get way back in the hill mm -hmm. how's your beers not bad i couldn't resist this can oh nice dude <laughs> got the state of new mexico on it oh yeah what flavor was it like a lager or um it's uh like Standard. Hmm. I don't know. I just buy for the cans. I get you. Going like way this. back in there. But yeah. a couple of the crossings get really gnarly. Giving me a lot of different uh, geographical vibes. It's mm -hmm. like on this side, kind of looks like the Payson area, oh, the yeah. Rocky Rim <laughs> area. This kind of looks like Aravipa Canyon. On the way down, it kind of looks like Canab. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Barracks Trail. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to do it, guys. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, I just want you to know I appreciate you. I hope you enjoyed the video, and until next time, good night, YouTube.